Okay, this is Michael Saltman from Blue Sky Bio, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for tonight's webinar presentation. While we're waiting for everybody to log in, I'd like to start by apologizing for the confusion of time and schedule that we had scheduled for this past Sunday. It's completely, I dropped the ball on this one. Corey had told me his, his schedule and his church schedule, and I went ahead and publicized the time for this webinar at the same time same time as all our other webinars and Corey was at church when the webinar was supposed to have been start starting and again that's my fault i apologize and thanks everybody for rejoining us tonight the good news is we have a fantastic and tremendous turnout more people registering and attending and joining us so that's the silver lining in the whole story uh, we have a lot going on with at blue sky bio with blue sky plan we released a new software build recently with new functionality, new implant catalogs. We did change the surgical guide design process by displaying the undercut model. So just take a look at those videos that we're pushing out. You could see the link in the bottom of the software. It demonstrates and explains the new process. And we are continuing to refine it and optimize it for future releases. But it's important to watch the video so you could see the changes that we made in the surgical guide design process. A few technical things regarding the webinar. As usual, we'll be sending out the CE credits to anybody who attends. You should be getting those within a week or two. And if you have questions during the presentation, then go ahead and enter them into the chat box and we'll see how many questions we could get uh, Corey to answer. This is the first webinar of the 2021 webinar series. We have a great lineup of fantastic speakers and topics. So go ahead and check out the links that we have on the slide in front of you. Uh, Blueskyplan.com webinars 2021. This Sunday, already in uh, two days, two or three days, we'll be hearing from Dr. Rick Ferguson. And really pretty much every Sunday from that point onwards, we'll, for the next couple of months, we'll be hearing from Dr. Baron Grother, Dr. Raymond Rofi, Dr. Scott Gans, uh, Dr. Melissa Chateau, Dr. Scherer, and many, many others. So check out the schedule. Register for the webinar. They're all no charge and one CE credit. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from the one and only Dr. Corey Glenn be discussing Blue Sky Plan for Restorative Treatment. I'm sure all of you have already heard of Corey, the VP of Technology at Blue Sky Bio, global leader in dental technology, international lecturer, and really playing a key role in molding the future of dentistry. Corey, why don't you take it from here? All right. Thank you very much. And uh, again, apologies on my end too for the the miscommunication. For what it's worth, I uh, saw the the message from Michael about ten minutes after the supposed start time, and when I saw it, I ran out of church out the back door and was trying to go do it, but uh, I was a little too late. So, uh, no worries. We'll we'll cover it tonight. Uh, so yeah, my uh, my task was to cover Blue Sky Plan for restorative treatment, and so I'll be going over that. Uh, let me see here, Michael. How do I make my screen shared? Yeah, you should have a button there to share your screen. Share screen. Here we go. All right, are you able to see it? Yep. Okay, great. Let's get rid of that. Still good? Still good. Okay. All right. Great. So yeah, we're uh, going to cover, cover just some basic restorative stuff because, you know, I, I love to talk about uh, implants and these big full arch cases, but honestly, for most of us, that's hobby dentistry that we might get to do a couple of times a year. What you really do that makes you your money, or at least it did in my practice, was the day-to-day -day restorative. That's your crowns, your bridges, your fillings. Uh, you know, occasional dentures. And so I think this is a much more down to earth topic. It's not flashy and fancy, like some of the stuff I like to show, but very, very practical. And I think you'll find a lot of uses for this. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, I've got my email address at the end of this presentation. Uh, you can also contact me through the website, although I think it might have gone down here in the last couple of days. So I've got to work on that. But nonetheless, I'm easy to get a hold of. Uh, Cglen at blueskybio.com. So I'm, I'm somewhat recycling a presentation I did fairly recently for the Yankee Dental Congress on some of these new permanent crown and bridge resins that are available for printing. 
And I'm doing that because that's a really, really practical way that if you're trying to get into doing all of this in-house design and making your own restorations, I've been extremely impressed with those resins, uh, in particular the uh, the Vigo Varseo crown. That's the one that's uh, approved for FDA in the States. Uh, I think there's a few more coming, Ceramco's Crown Tech. Uh, Envision Tech's got one. I forget their, their name of it. But these materials are super exciting, and they really do an excellent job. I've been incredibly uh, impressed with the results. Again, I'm not clinically practicing anymore, but I am doing these for other people and, you know, they're testing them out for me. And just as an example, you know, I've, I've printed a crown out of this material and then stood on it with my boot on a concrete floor without breaking. So that says a lot. I, I remember from my CERAC days, if I'd have done that with a, a Lava Ultimate or a, uh, a Feldspathic crown, I mean, they just shatter into a million pieces. So I think that's a really easy way to get into this, even if you don't decide to go into milling or whatever, or you might just choose to design your restorations and then have them milled by any number of places, uh, for example, Lab Pronto. So uh, a lot of this will focus around printing and uh, you know just doing restorations in your office, but Blue Sky Design is kind of the common thread throughout all that. So start out, start out uh, what are the current options if you did want to create restorations in-house? Well, there's the obvious ones. You got composite and amalgam, uh, which are great and they're really cheap materials, but you know there is a huge learning curve to doing those well uh, and to making them look nice. You know, a lot of the composites I saw in practice, so they might have been functional, but they sure weren't pretty. Uh, they weren't anything I'd want to have in my mouth. Um, so we've got composite and amalgam. You can do indirect restorations, uh, model-based restorations. I know some people will use, uh, do an impression and pour it up in that Mach 2 material from Parkell so that they can just have a working model outside of the mouth. And you can create composite restorations out of that stuff. I used to do what I called the poor man's CERAC, uh, which was basically a, a permanent crown and bridge dual cure material was used in the same way that you'd make a temporary. And I would do that, uh, trim it up, and then bond it in with the resin cement. And those held up great uh, you know, for people that just had really limited finances, but when you needed full cuspal coverage. Uh, but now there, we've got some materials that are, are more conducive to this. I'll, I'll show you what I've kind of migrated towards now. Uh, of course, you got to mention, if you're talking in-house dentistry, CERAC, it's uh, still kind of the leading system on in-house milling and it works great. I had one in my own practice. I used the heck out of it. Uh, the obvious disadvantage to it is it comes with a huge price tag. And so uh, that may not make sense for all practices. Uh, in addition to that, you know, there's other mills. Um, for example, I'll tell you toward the end about a, a new project I'm involved with. But um, as a preview to that, we've, we've recently uh, acquired uh, some five axis mills from Axis Dental. Uh, Blue Sky does sell those on our website. Um, extremely impressive what these things can do. And, you know, one of them, for example, is about $40,000 and it will do uh, Emacs blocks. It will do pucks of material. You can mill PMMA full arch. You can mill full arch zirconia. You can mill anything that you can get in a puck full of dentures, um, all of that stuff. And it's a $40,000 mill. It'll even do titanium pre-mill blanks. And so when you couple that with, say, the $3,000 Blue Sky desktop scanner, which you could just scan a triple tray and it's ready to go into design. And then you've got the design software and Blue Sky plan, which for Crown and Bridge is 100% free. Uh, I don't know if that will go forever, but for the near indefinite future, there's no cost whatsoever to either download the software or to export restorations from the Crown and Bridge. That would only come into play uh, with a cost when you're doing surgical guides, ortho, um, dentures, that kind of thing. So it's hard to beat free on the price. And then it would go from that into your $40,000 mill, which again, is a, it's a commercial lab mill. You know, it will do anything you throw at it. And then a centering oven for 10,000 bucks. And at $50,000, you've got, uh, something that, yes, you could do same day dentistry, but you are also now basically a commercial lab. You can do almost anything that walks through the door except for a full arch titanium bar. And that's just because that's the next mill up that would be able to do that. It takes a lot stronger spindle. 
So Cerex is great. I still think it's the fastest option out there for same day dentistry. Um, you know, these other options I'm talking about, like the Axis Mill, uh, you are going to have to piece together multiple softwares and it will inevitably lead to a little bit slower process, but it's not much slower. And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping to be teaching a lot more of that in the very near future. But 3D printing is probably the easiest and the most accessible to most of the people who are going to be watching this. And, uh, you know, printing is a super easy technology to master. They're very inexpensive. You know, you can get a super high end printer uh, like the uh, Sprint Ray Pro, for example, for around $7,000 in dentistry terms. That's virtually free. I mean, everything else that we buy is way more expensive than that. And you can now print your own permanent crowns and bridges on this. And they do look really nice. This uh, what you're seeing down there is actually some no prep veneers that I had designed in Blue Sky Plan and then exported and printed. So this was purely a wear case. And so this guy, if I had a preoperative intraoral scan on him, we could design these, create the final restorations before he even comes back for a second appointment. And then one appointment could essentially do a full mouth rehab on him. Uh, this material prints really well. Those are in places 0.3 millimeters thick. You can actually see the model shining through. And so you can get incredible detail on these things. So I would imagine most of you, if you're going to dabble in this, will probably start out by 3D printing it. Uh, now, just a, a word of uh, advice before I get into actual design and stuff is, you know, as you get into this, you're obviously going to have to have a few things to be able to get started. You're going to have to have some way of generating models, right? Um, if you're going to do printing, you're going to have to have some kind of printer. If you're going to do centering, you've got to have some kind of oven. Okay, so there's all these components that come together if you're going to make these restorations in-house. I would strongly recommend only buying technology that's open. And what I mean by that is that it plays nice with uh, other systems. You know, for example, in the system I mentioned, I've got to make sure that if I scan it with a uh, CareStream scanner, that that gives me access to my STLs that I can pull into Blue Sky, which is an open software which I can then export to Hyperdent, which is a, uh, an open source cam into an open source mill, right? Um, things like Serac, for example, that would be considered a closed system. And yeah, if you're all in and you buy the entire Serac system, it's excellent. It works really well. They've done a great job of simplifying that whole workflow. Again, it just comes at a premium cost. So it's a matter of opinion here, but I am very much to the, the side of the spectrum that recommends using open source stuff because I, I just don't see that the cost savings are there anymore for trying to do all your lab work in house at those really high prices. Um, so what are the components of that open system? Well, first of, of all, you've got to acquire data. So that's either gonna be in the form of an intraoral scanner or a desktop scanner. Uh, obvious advantage to an intraoral scanner is going to be that it's quick, you know, you've got immediate feedback and it's already digitized and you just go. The one people don't think about most often is the desktop scanner though. And this can be an excellent option, especially for those people that are kind of kicking the tires, not sure if they want to invest a ton of money into trying to do all this stuff. You know, you can buy a desktop scanner very inexpensively. Uh, Shining 3D has one for about $5,000, which we sell. Um, Blue Sky, we recently developed our own. It's $3,000. And the cool thing of this is that you could not alter your current workflow whatsoever. For example, in a crown prep, you could simply go ahead and do your PVS impression. But typically where you'd have to let that degas for a couple of hours before pouring it and then doing all the model work, in the case of a triple tray impression, you can actually take that straight out of the mouth, dry it off, and then put it right into one of these desktop scanners. It will scan it top and bottom, and then you have it digitized. So yeah, you're adding a step, but for many people, they don't want to change a lot of aspects to their workflow. So this can be an excellent option. The end result of either is going to be the same. You're going to have STL files, which you can now take into your design software brings us to design. You know, you've got a bunch of options there. Again, if we talked about the Serona system, there's the Serona uh, Serac chairside software, which works with their same day dentistry system. Uh, they have a lab software that will do the more complex stuff. Say if you had a five axis mill, uh, things like hybrids. So that's Serona in lab. But the two biggest players right now are going to be Exocad and 3Shape. Um, you know, both are very good softwares, 
highly developed. They can do anything in the world. And then we're kind of the new guy on the block as far as the design uh, aspect goes. And, you know, right now I can honestly say that I can design a single tooth crown faster in Blue Sky Plan than I can in any of the others. And I've, I've got access to all the others. So that's really saying something. Now it's new, so it's not gonna be as advanced. So as you start getting into the complex things like trying to design, uh, let's say a full arch hybrid, something like that, it's not there yet. And so if you are really gonna double down on trying to make those and mill them in house, you're gonna need ExoCAD or three shape. I'm an ExoCAD person. I like it, it fits more with my open philosophy, but three shapes excellent as well, as well as Serona InLab. So really it's a personal choice there. But I think for the person who's just getting into this and for the person just doing their routine dentistry, not the complex stuff, if you're doing routine crowns and bridges in your office, I think Blue Sky Plan is the logical choice because all these others are going to cost you $10,000 to invest in up front. Whereas again, Blue Sky Plan, free to download and for crowns and bridges, totally free to use. <clears throat> and then finally, you got your fabrication. So that would be in the form of either a four axis mill. That's what the Serona uh, Serac chair side mill is. Um, so it's, it's going to generally just do block materials, things that would fit within a small block. Um, you've got a five axis mill, like the axis mill that I was talking about. And that axis mill, you know, again, it'll mill anything that you give to it. It can mill the discs, it can mill blanks, it can mill pre-mill titanium to make custom abutments. So that's a really cool option. Again, that one I mentioned is about 40,000. But again, 3D printer is the often overlooked one and uh, probably for good reason until now because we didn't have the materials, but now we do. And so I'll talk a lot more about that. Again, just a couple of the pros and cons of intraoral scanners. Again, the ease of use, no stone, no impressions. That's clearly the obvious advantages. The downside is the cost, right? Um, and then the other downside is if you're going to get into doing things like dentures, the intraoral scanners are going to struggle uh, capturing tissue accurately. For one, you're having to stretch the, the cheeks so that your borders are going to be overextended. They'll be overlapping on that movable tissue. Um, but for hard tissue, you know, it does great. Um, so that's kind of intraoral scanners. The downside to desktops are that you still are going to have to use uh, impression material. Um, in the case of triple trays, you can just scan impressions. If you're trying to do full arch models, you're going to have to pour it up in stone and then scan that. So you don't have immediate uh, access to your results, but they're super easy to use and the cost is just insanely low. Uh, and then also, if you're going to get into dentures, even if you have an intraoral scanner, I think you need at least one of these low cost desktop scanners because for edentulous cases, it's going to do a lot better. All right, so that's kind of my intro here, and I'm going to now just basically do some demonstration. I've, I've done a type of dot case here where um, I can show you a single crown design, a bridge design, and a titanium, uh, a tie based crown. Okay, so those are all workflows that uh, work out really well right now in Blue Sky Plan. So let's just go ahead and do some live demo. And uh, Michael, if there's questions throughout, just stop me. This might be a good time to ask any if there's any stacking up. Um, no, not yet. But if okay. you have questions, Great. there's the Q&A uh, box. So just enter the Q&A box and we'll feed them to Corey. All right. So this is obviously the, uh, the starting menu of Blue Sky Plan. So we're going to do crown and bridge here. And you've got to choose something here. So even though I've got one type of dot case where I'm going to do all of these things, I'm just going to choose conventional crown for right now. And it's going to prompt you to bring in your models. Important thing here is you want to bring all of the models in simultaneously because each time you bring something in, it forces you to align them and you won't ever be able to exactly align them the same if you didn't bring them in all together. So let's go ahead and grab our mandibular pre-op and our maxillary pre-op. And then we've got our uh, mandibular final and our maxillary final. I'm going to bring all of those in. And you don't have to bring in the pre-op. Um, I would recommend it, though, because that is something that's going to really help you during your design phase, uh, because you can see what they had to start with. And if it was good, you can somewhat replicate it. All right, so the first step is you're going to have to align everything. And so you've got three methods of alignment. We're going to choose dentate because these are full arch uh, intraoral scans. 
we'll just choose one of those maxillary models and go ahead and click next. And so it's going to prompt us in that upper right corner to uh, orient the models by placing some dots. And so first dot we're going to put on the second molar, second dot we're going to put right at the midline, and the third we're going to put on the other uh, contralateral mo molar. And that's going to align it to this grid. So as you see, the teeth have now been placed uh, where the occlusal plane is sitting right on this uh, X plane. And hopefully the midline is passing right through the Y. If it's not, you do have the opportunity at this point to go ahead and modify that. And so I always recommend going ahead and, and just getting this where everything lines up. And this is less important for just onesie twosie restorations, but when you're doing full arch stuff or let's say wax ups, it's really helpful to get that grid aligned because now you can know I need to place the new teeth right on this plane uh, without having to turn models on and off and all that kind of thing. Same with the midline. Okay, so we've done that. And as you notice, it's got all of the models. So as we're aligning this, it's going to apply that uh, orientation to all of the models in the case. And now we're basically done with that. So if you needed to do anything while you're in the model editing, for example, if you wanted to make a solid model so that you could print it to do a, a try in or something, you can do that. But here I'm going to keep a fully digital workflow. So I'm going to jump to the crown design. Let me see if I can hide this. Well, I don't know how to hide that. So maybe I can just move it. Yeah, let's do that. All right. So the uh, the start to make a crown is I would suggest go ahead and position some teeth. So you've got your normal uh, panels like you always see in Blue Sky Plan, right? You can just check them on and off as visible or not. Um, you can turn on the closeness, which is the contact proximity. And so this is our pre-op situation. I just want to show you the models before I jump into this. So there's the maxillary pre-op and the mandibular. So this was a case done on the, the type of dot that I made. Uh, if you didn't know that, I, I have a 3D printed or 3D printable type of dot uh, that I sell the download to. So you can actually do that. And then, you know, unlike dental school where it's seven bucks a tooth, you can just print as many replacement teeth as you need. Pretty nice for training. But what I've done with that is I just took out one of the teeth and made a Pontic site on tooth number 10. And then the lower arch, I'm going to simulate doing an implant. So let's say it's just an edentulous site right now. So we'll turn those off and I'll show you the prep models. So here is the preps. Okay, this was for a bridge from 9 to 11. It's for a single crown on tooth number 3 and then a single tooth implant on tooth number 30. So we're going to go ahead and restore all of these. But I'll kind of take them one at a time. So the first thing that I want to do is just the basic crown on tooth number three. And so the starting point, you could do this later in the process, but I think it's easiest and most intuitive if you'll go ahead and just select a tooth. Uh, you can go to any of these libraries, you know, just play around with them, see which ones you like. I, I've kind of used them enough now that I, I know the shapes of the teeth and what's going to be similar to what that patient's dentition is. So I'm going to choose tooth number three, OK, and then hold shift and drop it into place. And now I can go and turn on the manipulate model and start positioning this. So if I just grab the tooth, I can bodily move it down into position. I can use this rotation widget. And all I'm doing as I'm designing this is I'm trying to reference that adjacent tooth. You know, if I look at it from the distal, I'm wanting to see all of my cusp tips kind of on a row. They ought to be on a single line with your buccal and lingual. So this needs to come over some. And it looks like it might be a little wider than these teeth. So I can use that little uh, point at the end to scale back the size. And so now the angulation looks good. The central gro uh, groove depth is about the same and the cusps are in the same line. Now I can be looking at the uh, mesial to distal spacing. So this needs to be shrunken down a little bit. And then I can just position this within the edentulous space. Maybe rotate it just slightly. And that's really about as detailed as you have to get on the tooth placement. You don't have to perfect this right now because you're going to have opportunities to alter that later in the process. Uh, but let's go ahead and do this single tooth crown. So if you don't see it tabbed over here, the restoration design, you can go to panels 
and restoration design. And you're going to have a drop down menu and it lets you choose what are you doing here? Are you doing a conventional crown or a crown on a tie base? Well, we're going to do a conventional crown here and we just need to tell it what models we're working on. So the, the working model is the red one, the maxillary scan. The tooth model that we're turning into a crown is the one that's in the case here. And then the antagonist is going to be our mandibular. I'll just do the pre-op. Uh, there's not a tooth opposing it, so it really won't matter a lot. So we just indicate those things. And now we push start. Hang on. Mandibular pre-op. Ah, I screwed up here. I need to have the red one. There we go. Okay, so first step is we need to define the margin. Now, if the tooth is in your way, you can just toggle it off in your visibility panel. So I'm going to zoom way in here and go ahead and start drawing the margin. And so right there, right off the bat, I put it in the wrong spot. I can just hold shift and then move that point to wherever I need to. And I'm going to work my way around the arch, just indicating where the margin is on this. Now, some of your intraoral scanners are going to give you the ability to do this uh, directly within the intraoral scanner. Uh, otherwise, you can just do it in this software. It doesn't really matter which way. So I was not watching carefully and I started placing my margin where it wasn't. But kind of look at it from about a 45 degree angle like this, and it will make it a lot easier to make out where the change in contour is for that margin. And we are working on the auto margination and all that kind of stuff, but it was a little quirky in our first runs. So right now we just left it as a, a manual draw margin. It's not very time consuming to do this at all. And then your last dot, you need to be sure that you drag into the first one to change the or to close the contour. So that's our final margin proposal. If I see anywhere that I dropped off, I can just hold shift and then redraw that spot like that, and it will refine that margin. So we're just kind of in a wizard workflow. That's step one of six. I'll click next. And now it's giving me a path of draw. And I've screwed something up here. All right, let me cancel this. I'm sorry. Something I started out with was not right because it had the entire path of draw blocked out. So this this is what I messed up. All right. So even when you've been doing this a long time, you still make mistakes. This is a crown on the maxilla. That's why it was coming in from the wrong angle. So I'm going to breeze through that real quick again. So now we've got it. And now it's going to do what it's supposed to, which is give me a chance to indicate a path of draw. So any kind of undercut is going to show up as a dark brown color. And that's why I knew I was in trouble uh, previously. It was because the whole thing was brown because it was trying to build a crown for the opposing arch. If you don't like the path of draw it proposes, you can just orient it to where you're looking down on your prep and you can see every portion of it with no undercuts. And then you can just say set insertion direction from this view. And now my insertion direction has been changed to that. Click next, define your proximal areas. So this is important for later steps when it's going to adjust the contact. It needs to know what is the proximal area to subtract so that you don't have interference. Um, if you get a little overzealous with your tool there, you can use the control button to be an eraser. And now we'll click next again. So the, the step that it's doing now is the crown bottom. So this is the intaglio or the fitting surface of your crown. The parameters that it's going to be defaulted to are pretty much the ideal parameters if you're going to have this crown milled. Now, just to change things up, let's actually make it where we're going to print this. So printing is not 
quite as accurate as milling. So you're inherently going to need a little bit more of a ground cement spacer. And I find 0.2 to be about perfect on uh, the printers that I'm using. I'm using the SprintRay Pro 55 to print crowns. And then the other thing is typically when you mill a crown, you're going to have this zone about a millimeter from the margin where there's no cement gap whatsoever. And that's what gives you that really tight fit. However, with printing, we do need to uh, minimize that. So I take that down to 0.1 because again, printing is not quite as accurate. So when you're talking about a dead zero, that's, that's a little pushing it on printing. So you need to create a, a little less of a uh, intimate fit for the printer. And then everything else is going to be perfectly fine. So I'll click next now. And here's the opportunity you have to go ahead and further adjust on the crown. So again, I'm looking at the cusps. I like where those are, but I do see that, you know, right here in the central groove, I'm way too thin. So I could use any number of tools. I can use the add and remove. If I hold shift, it's an add tool. And I can just pull up that entire central groove. Okay, you could also use the smooth tool. Uh, so if you have a rough spot that you don't like, you can smooth that out. And then local deform is great. Uh, those of you who might have used CEREC in the past will be familiar with this tool. For example, I can adjust the spot size and I can pull a hu huge area underneath that spot size out. So you can make really big changes very quickly with that tool. So like if I wanted to bring up this entire occlusal groove, I could just grab that and bring it up all at once rather than using the uh, add and remove tool. Okay. I'm obviously a little thick on my contact there. I could bring that back slightly, but I'm not going to worry a whole lot about that because it's going to subtract any kind of interference with contacts at the end. Same with the occlusion. Okay. And I'm just going to smooth one spot right here. And now we're ready to go ahead and go to uh, the finalizing of the crown. So when you click next, what it's doing is it's merging that outer shell, the, the way the tooth appears right here, and it's merging it down to the margin on that crown bottom that we designed. And this is going to be your crown proposal. So now if you zoom in really closely, you can see how it's got that intimate fit right at the margin. The uh, excess of the tooth has been cut away and it has defined that margin just like we told it to. And as a final step here, we can turn on these check boxes. And what these will do is cut away any kind of intersections that it's got with the adjacent teeth or with the opposing. So right now you can see I've got a really heavy contact right there indicated by red. Um, if I turn on the opposing model, then you can see kind of how it fits against the opposing arch. And here there's not any contact with the opposing, so there's not much point in uh, trying to show anything with that. So last step is I'm gonna just push next and it will finalize that crown. And while it's doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch my Rayware software. And we'll just do this entire process as if we were gonna uh, actually print this tooth and try to do a same day restoration, okay? So it's finalized now. This is our final crown. If I turn on the transparency, you can see that it's cut away that contact to a dead zero. So this should have a great fit. Uh, there wasn't any opposing interference. And if we look at the internal of it, you can see the prep underneath. And so the 0.2 cement gap that we built in, you can see right here. And then right at the margin, it's got that zero cement gap. So let's go ahead and export this and uh, just take this to completion. I can go to file, export data, tell it what I wanna export. And in this case, all I wanna export is what will be labeled custom crown. And we'll pull that into maybe our downloads or wherever you wanna save it. And now that's done, we're ready to print it. And so I just go to add model, find it in my downloads, and then position it where I want it on the build plate, generate supports, and it's ready to print. Now I'm not hooked up to my printer right now, but you can see this would take 23 minutes to print if you're doing 100 microns. Um, the material that's gonna be involved is going to be 
0.4 milliliters of resin. So that's one thing I will say about this, uh, the new crown and bridge, the new permanent crown and bridge resins is that they are very expensive. You know, for a liter, you're looking at, you know, 1,000, 1,200 bucks. And that equates to roughly a dollar per milliliter. But that's not near as painful when you realize that a typical crown may only be 0.4 milliliters up to maybe a maximum of one milliliter. So this crown in overhead of materials would cost you basically 50 cents to print. I can deal with that. That's, uh, that's pretty easy. So we'd simply push print now if I was hooked up and 23 minutes later, we would have that uh, ready. And that's really the entire process. After printing, you could take that out. You could wash it in alcohol for three minutes, uh, scrub off any of the excess resin, cure it, and then sandblast and you're ready to bond. Uh, I would recommend using a resin cement to truly bond these, because uh, otherwise, if you're using just a conventional cement, they're not really a super, super hard material like say zirconia crown that you know can deal with that. They potentially could flex a little bit, at least I'm saying that based on other composite like materials that I've used in the past. So they really do need to be bonded. But uh, again, super easy. I, if I hadn't screwed that up and been talking the whole time, I would say on average, it takes me about five minutes to design a crown in Blue Sky Plan. And again, that's, that's hard to beat for a free software. So Michael, any questions before I jump into the bridge? Yep, we have a bunch of questions that came in. All right. Uh, if you want to see them, you could pull them up in the Q&A, but I'll start by reading them out to you as well. Okay. First comment question, my mind is blown right now. I've I'm already thinking of ways to use this to make in-house flippers with tooth color contacts and then pink with clasps and use resin to connect it to. Is this possible? Everything's possible. So <laughs> yeah, you can do that. <clears throat> it's, it's not a dedicated workflow right now within Blue Sky Plan, uh, but for example, you could just... Um, kind of wax the teeth up and get the occlusion right. And then if you were just gonna hack it to try and make a flipper, let's say, you could just draw a quote surgical guide uh, on the lingual of the gingiva and on the adjacent teeth. It would make that, you could control the thickness of it. So if you wanted it to be a uniform two milli milliliter, millimeters thick, uh, you could just make your guide be that. And then when you export that along with the crown, you've got a flipper that you can now print. And there's also uh, flexible resins that you can 3D print, um, you know, that are similar to the Valplast. I know uh, a couple of companies have got those. I know the Ceramco uh, company does, I believe Envision Tech does, but it's like a flexible resin uh, for doing partials like that. So absolutely that's doable. Um, what is the recommended PC specs for processor and all that? Uh, so Michael, maybe, I think you'd be the better one to answer on this. I know what I have, but what would you say is the optimal to run Blue Sky Plan? So first I would start by saying Windows 10 is a must. Okay, we have, with our recent update, we saw how many users are using Windows 7 and Windows 8. And the recent uh, update and moving forward, you know, will only run on Windows 10. Windows 10 came out quite a few years ago. So that really shouldn't be an issue. On top of that, the software will run, let's say with, you know, eight gigabytes of RAM, but that's definitely not recommended. You know, today, at least in the States for a thousand dollars, you could probably get a computer with 32 gigabytes of RAM, i7 or better, and RAM on the video card. Having dedicated RAM on the video card, you know, two gigabytes or four gigabytes is what you want to be going for. So it's actually, it's not the crown and bridge module, which is the heavy uh, processing. It's more surgical guides and ortho, although, you know, it's obviously all the same software. So I'd say, you know, spend a bit more, get more specs. It will save your processing time. It'll make the software work much better. Today, STL files are quite heavy. They keep getting heavier and heavier from the intraoral scanners, from desktop scanners, same thing with uh, CT scans. So if possible, I'd say spend a bit more, get, you know, 32 gigabytes of RAM, get an i7 processor better and get the dedicated RAM on the video card. That's, a, that's an important point. All right. Good job. That was better than my answer would have been. Um, do you have any recommended parameters pr uh, posted for crowns, uh, printing crowns? Uh, well, I do now because this is about to be online, but um, really there's not much to remember. I, it will be somewhat printer dependent from, for the printers I'm using, which are very accurate. I use a 0.2 cement spacer and I take the uh, 
the zero margin thickness down to zero um, or 0.1, whatever the lowest you can go is. That's really all that you got to do as far as difference between milling versus printing. Um, and by the way, for those of you who might be milling, let's say you have a little open source roll and mill in your office or something, uh, those need construction data for the cam of the mill. And Blue Sky Plan does now put out construction data for that. So that won't be a problem for you. Um, is there a minimum thickness option? There is, I, uh, I didn't point that out, but when I do the bridge here in a moment, I will point that out. Um, what code would you use for billing? Uh, well, thankfully, I don't have to worry about that anymore because I only treat models. Um, I'm, I'm not a wet finger dentist anymore, but uh, I think there are codes for uh, resin crowns, but you might check. I, I remember when I was doing CERAC, uh, that Lava Ultimate material, they allowed you to bill as ceramic crowns. And so these are highly filled resins with ceramic particles, and they very well may fall under those same um, parameters for billing. So I'm not sure exactly the answer to that, but I would assume you probably could do the same. Um, are the printable resin physical properties as good or better than light cured direct composite? They definitely are. Um, these things are insanely strong. Uh, the, the light cure composites I've used could not hold up to the same level of abuse that, that these things do. And finally, can the Form 2 be used for crown printing? It definitely can. Well, I, I say that. I don't know for sure. I think so. But I was thinking the Form 3, you know, I, I do have a Form 3, if you can see on my screen here, uh, sitting on the, the desk over here. So I, I've used the Form 3B printer. I've used the Sprint Ray Pro 55 and 95. Uh, it's just a simple DLP resin. So if it cures at, uh, what is it, 405 nanometers, then chances are you can print this material. All right, so that's all the questions for now. We'll go well, ahead. There are a few other questions oh, that there? came in on the, on the okay. chat. Um, first of all, somebody commented, and I, I hear it as well, there's a slight whistling in the background. I don't know if there's anything that you could do, that you mm -hmm. could do about that. No. Um, What's going on in here? Maybe if I adjust my mic, is that any better? Uh, let's give it a try. I think okay. it's it's less now. Okay. Okay. What did Corey mean about the co the cons of using stone in a desktop scanner? Well, there's no cons other than the fact that you have to pour it up in stone. So it's just the time required to do that. Um, you know, it would be ideal if you could just take every impression and skip the stone and just scan it directly. And for triple trays, yes, you can do that. Uh, where you can't necessarily scan impressions is with full arch impressions, because uh, just think about it. If, if you look at an impression and you can't readily see every surface of every tooth, the scanner can't either. Okay. You've usually got anterior teeth that are inclined plus a, uh, you know, a labial fold that's kind of hiding them. And so usually a desktop scanner, if you're just scanning an impression, is going to miss the lingual areas of those teeth. Uh, same with really long teeth. You know, it's trying to get the scanning light down into a deep, dark hole. And so it might not be able to. But again, for posterior teeth and for triple trays where everything is oriented straight up and down and it's not that deep, I've, I've actually never had a failure on a triple tray uh, that I can recall. So it really is a, uh, an easy process for your single tooth day-to-day -day crowns. Okay. Uh, I see when, here, what is a good printer to buy that balances the cost and features? Uh, there's so many good ones now. The, the Sprint Ray Pro, I think, is the fastest right now that I'm aware of. Um, and it's got a huge bill plate. So that's a big plus on that. Again, I've also got this Form 3B printer. It does an excellent job. It's really clean prints. Um, it's somewhat of a closed system because you can only print their materials, but they actually have this permanent crown and bridge material. And so the downside with the Form 3 is that it's using a single point laser to cure things. So it'll be a little slower. Some people say the prints are a little smoother because of that. Um, but one pro that they have is since all of their resins are verified and you only print their resins, I very rarely have a failure. So I would say either of those are a really great option. And then also Sprint Ray has the Pro 55, which is a smaller build plate size and just higher resolution. 
Um, you know, if you feel like you need that higher resolution, you can do that. And then the Envision Tech printers that I mentioned earlier, they're an excellent option as well. Um, what I love about Envision Tech is some of the innovative resins that they have. So they do have a permanent crown and bridge resin. They've also got a denture based resin that competes with the strength of a conventional acrylic processed denture, which is huge. Uh, I don't know of anyone else that has something uh, in denture bases right now that would compete there. Um, 7,000 is a big gamble post COVID numbers. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, for the printer. Uh, again, I guess it's all relative to you. I, from my perspective, and I use it for a million different things. Um, it's a relatively low cost again, because I'm comparing it to, you know, 100 bucks per case on a lab bill. I'm comparing it to 200 bucks per surgical guide. I'm comparing it to $300 per denture. And every one of those things that I do in house is just money in the bank. So I see it as a profit center as opposed to a, a gamble. But if you think you might end up, you know, just leaving it on the shelf and not really using it, then yeah, it, it'd be a waste of money for you. Well, let me uh, jump in and just mention Lab Pronto because Lab Pronto yeah, yeah. is a great way. You design everything in house, you know, control whatever you want to control, and then just send the manufacturing out to Lab Pronto. And that's a good transition. And then once you feel comfortable and you feel like you want to get the printer, then go ahead and bring it in house. But Lab Pronto is a great resource to get the manufacturing done. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you a quick example on that. You know, Clear Align or Ortho, if you're doing Invisalign, I don't know what their full case fee is now, but several thousand, you could simply take intraoral scans and some pictures, upload them to Lab Pronto. And for $100 an arch, roughly, they will do the design for you provide it back, you can give input on it. Uh, but then once you've got the design, you didn't lift a finger to do that. And now you simply print the models and suck them down. And that's your clear aligner ortho case. So think about the savings on that. If you do a lot of clear aligners, it's thousands of dollars every single case. Um, do you buy a selection of shades uh, and can color be modified by staining? You can definitely stain it. And they do have five or six shades of this. Uh, you know, posterior crowns, I'd probably be the guy that had A2 for everyone, but um, yeah, there is multiple shades. And again, they're big upfront expenses, but you don't have to buy a liter. You know, you can buy a half a liter um, and you also get a lot of crowns out of that resin. So that's not as painful. Uh, is that, are those all answered now, Michael, or was there more? There's another question about the thickness of the crowns when adding thickness to the crown what prevents having a high spot in occlusion and connected to that somebody else asked how do you control how do you control the final restoration thickness yeah so you've got a minimal thickness um uh parameter in the design which i'll show on this next one uh so anywhere that it's not thick enough you're going to see a big red spot shining through and you can force the software to maintain that minimum thickness now if if you do that, you've obviously got to be aware of the opposing tooth. And so, you know, later in the design phase, there's actually a, a color intensity map. You didn't see it on that one just because it didn't have an opposing tooth, but you would see that color intensity and you could know if it's high or, you know, when it's just right and you could adjust accordingly. If you still don't have adequate thickness after uh, doing that, well, that's, that's a prep problem, right? You just didn't reduce the tooth enough. So, um, that's, that's kind of out of the software's control at that point. Is that okay. it? Let, yeah, let's go on. All right. So let's do a bridge now. So the bridge is going to be very, very similar in the process. The only difference is that we're going to, we're going to basically design three individual units here, a Pontic and each, um, abutment tooth. And then at the very end, we're just going to merge them into a bridge. So um, a little different from, you know, say Exocat or Three Shapes workflow. And this is something we're still tweaking and modifying and whatnot. Um, so this will continue to improve, but it's still a very simple process. I'm just going to go up here and say add tooth. And I'm going to choose one of my libraries of teeth. So we could use the Ponic library here. This is tooth 10 or 9, 10, and 11. So if I hold down control select, I can click on all three of those and add them all at once and then shift and just click those into place. Okay. And you can initially move all of these as a single unit. 
Okay, so you can pull this back and get it into the approximate position. Okay, so that's pretty darn close right off the bat. Pull it up, but I'm not gonna spend too much time there. I'm gonna go on over and go ahead and use my, um, you know, my typical adjustment tools. So the first thing I'll do is just manipulate model. And I'm just going to get all of these teeth in the approximate position that they really need to be. And here's where I think it's very valuable for you to have done a preoperative scan, because while I'm doing this, I can actually turn on their preoperative tooth and I can see where was their existing tooth. So in this case, you know, maybe they had broken a big chunk off of, of this central incisor, but it still had the incisal edge position. It had the facial contour. And so I can just manipulate this around to try and mimic that. If I feel like I needed to twist it out a little bit more, I could. And if I needed to rotate it slightly, I can do that. All right. So that's got that tooth pretty darn close to what the preoperative was. And now I can move on to this one. So I need to move it over. This one won't have a tooth, obviously, because that was missing from the start in this scenario. And so I'm just trying to make sure I've got this nice smooth arc across all these buccal cusps and incisal edges. And that looks pretty nice. The distal contact is slightly open. So I'm gonna stretch this tooth a little bit. And that is something to be aware of is in the process of creating a bridge, you're gonna need a little bit of overlap between these teeth because that's what forms the connector between them. Um, the software is going to add a connector, but I also am tr I try to be mindful of it at this stage as well and go ahead and create a little bit of impingement into one another so that when I do bridge it, I know I've got a good strong connector between them. All right. And then finally, this canine, we can look again at the um, pre-op and that needs to be rotated out some and then just pulled to the buckle. And that's about it. I mean, my contact looks pretty darn close. If I look at this one, that looks good as well. And so now if I wanted to, and I don't really know that I even need to, but if I wanted to, I could go ahead and use some of the more detailed uh, smoothing tools, things like that. You know, if I wanted to come in here and reduce some of that anatomy on this, uh, this incisor, then I can simply do that and try to mimic closer this. Okay, so smooth that out, try to give it the same contour. I could look at my contact and reduce that a little bit. I could go ahead and now do the lateral. And that looks great as well. I don't see any further changes that are needed there. And then finally do the canine. Now the canine is a little bit more deficient. So I can turn on the transparency here and this is a great uh, time to use this local deform tool because I can grab a big chunk of this without grabbing the whole tooth. I can just pull that out ever so slightly. And now I've more or less mimicked the original preoperative tooth shape. Now I make a smaller spot size and I'm just bumping that up to try and get the same facial contour on this because aesthetically we're gonna pretend these were, uh, you know, nice virgin teeth. And so we might as well replicate what God gave them. If I wanted to pull the contact back slightly, I can do that here. All right, so we've got our tooth positioning done. The last thing I would do is maybe pull this out because, you know, it's always prone to under um, reduction on the lingual. So I don't want to make my design even thinner on the lingual than what the preoperative tooth was. Pull that little area up and that looks great. Now, a few of you asked about the opposing contact. So for example, uh, I don't usually do it at this stage, but let's say that I wanted to look at the proximity between this mandibular pre-op model and this maxillary central, okay? You see, I just turned on the closeness between those two. And I'm obviously over contoured on that. So I could just simply go back and grab the local uh, deform tool. This is one thing that when you start doing multi uh, 
restorations all at once, this drop down menu can be a little cumbersome. And that's actually something that we're working to alter so that, you know, you can just seamlessly switch between the teeth and uh, not have to, you know, go changing in the drop down menu. I need to quit talking and actually grab the right tool here. All right, so now I've got this and I'll just pull this back until it's not so tight in occlusion because I'm obviously well over contoured from where the preoperative was. I could maybe smooth that just a bit. Okay, so now it's looking like a good contact. Um, back to closeness, I could look at the um, lateral as well. So now if I change to the lateral, I can alter that. Let's just smooth it down a bit. And if that's not fast enough for you, you can grab the local deform. All right, that's a good contact. And then finally, we could look at the canine. And again, I usually would just not do this at this stage because there's an opportunity to do it later on and you're already there and it makes these contacts pop up automatically. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna leave this one and we'll just do that uh, during the design process. So let's go ahead and start this. Now remember, you're gonna design these basically as three individual crowns first. Okay, so think single tooth dentistry as you're doing this. Um, because that's essentially what you're doing. We're doing a crown on the maxilla. This is our prep model. Uh, choose whichever one you want to start with. I'm gonna do the central. And this is not a crown on a tie base, it's a conventional crown. And then our antagonist is right there. We're gonna plan a new restoration. And so I'm gonna hide everything here except for this red model at this point. And now I just need to draw the margin again. So Michael, I, I covered drawing margins earlier. Um, any questions right now? Yeah, a whole bunch. Okay. What's the shelf life of the printing resin? No idea, to be honest. Uh, I'm sure you could pull that up on their website. Um, I've never had a bottle last long enough to even bother. So okay. sorry, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, do you buy a selection of shades of the resin or can the color be modified by staining? Both. You can, uh, they do have five or six shades or you can use composite stains on these. Either one of those will work. Can you print multiple crowns at a time? Yeah, in fact, that's one of its huge advantages over uh, milling is that you can, uh, again, think back to one of my early slides where I was doing those no prep veneers you could print, let's say, 24 veneers or crowns or whatever all at once in one build, and it would be 23 minutes. With milling, you know, it grows exponentially as you start doing more units because uh, it's got to actually physically remove material from these things. So you could maybe mill them out of a disc and not ever have to stop and reconfigure, but it's still going to be a very slow process. So yeah, you can do Gosh, I bet you could fit a hundred something crowns on a single run if you were using like that Sprint Ray Pro. Okay, what's the event? I mean, you touched on this already or you discussed this already. What's the advantage of using Blue Sky Plan for crown and bridge fab fabrication over ExoCAD? Free, that's number one. Uh, number two is, you know, familiarity. If I love ExoCAD, I use it daily. It is not an easy product to learn. Um, and there's not a lot of resources out there to learn it. Uh, you know, not a lot of great tutorials like there are for Blue Sky Plan, which we've put up a bazillion of. Um, so it's cost, you know, you're, if you buy all the modules, you're looking at probably around 10,000 bucks to buy it. And again, it's a great program. I use it all the time, but it is costly. And if you're kicking tires and not sure that you're going to get deep into this, that may be uh, prohibitive on the front end. But, you know, eventually eventually Blue Sky will catch up and it'll have everything and then some that those programs have. And, you know, again, our cost model is tough to beat. So, uh, you know, next we'll, we'll try to match them. And then after that, we'll, it'll be world domination. Uh, are there any print, printable resins that are rated for full arch provision, provisionals? Is this a practical option at this point of time? So, Rated for it? No. Um, their FDA approval is for single tooth crowns and for bridges. Now with that said, and I've got some that I'll show you, I have used this material to print at this point probably 
15 to 20 full arch hybrid restorations. And those are, those got to take a beating. I mean, they have cantilevers and all that stuff and they can really uh, have trouble uh, holding up even to stuff like PMMA. I've got 15 to 20 arches of those out in the wild that I've designed for people and they've delivered. And again, it's an off label use, but they, none of them have broken to this point, which, you know, prior to this permanent resin, I had tried that. I can't tell you how many times and they universally all broke. The, the printing resin was just too brittle. These new ones have not. So that's, that's as much as I can tell you, but it's insanely strong. I would have zero problem, uh, you know, doing it with full arch provisionals. Okay. Um, last two questions are regarding a measuring tool and a copy tool for the teeth. Yeah, don't have them yet. Those will be in subsequent builds. Uh, in fact, I just yesterday or the day before, um, you know, went through a big thing with Michael about kind of a biocopy function. You know, if you had a scenario like this where you had perfect preoperative teeth and you just wanted to mimic those, then that's a desirable thing. So you can't do it yet, but that's coming. Again, it's just, it's a matter of time and programming. So we'll get there. Um, what was the other question? Um, copying and measuring the width of the oh, teeth. Oh, measuring. Yeah, there's there's not a measure. I suppose you, I guess you could jump over to the uh, surgical guide module and use our measuring tool there to measure in the 2D windows. But I don't really find a lot of value to it. Um, what I do in lieu of that is I'm just trying to look at symmetry. I'm just trying to evaluate uh, the size and see if they're the same width. You do also remember had this grid and so this grid, for those of you that didn't know, is five millimeter uh, squares. So if I'm looking at this from straight on, I can say, okay, this central here measures from this angle about eight millimeters. So as I'm doing this one and I'm designing it, it should cover about the same distance. Okay, so that's a, a unique feature that you can do to help with that. Okay, we also might have the 2D views accessible from the views right here in the horizontal toolbar. Yeah, yeah. So you could access it there as well. Um, okay, there are more questions coming in, but if you want to handle them now or you want to proceed. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to them here in a minute because uh, I did want to stop here and point out a lot of you asked about minimal thickness. Okay, so right now I have the minimal thickness uh, set at 0.66. You know, if I was going to mill this in zirconia, that's plenty. Um, you can hide that minimal thickness, you know, and it'll not show up. But that red kind of bubble that you're seeing around this, that is the minimal thickness. Okay. And if that's deficient anywhere, like I'm going to intentionally here make that a little big, hoping that it, it will show somewhere that the minimal thickness is uh, being impinged on. So let's click next. And of course it didn't because I didn't pull it out enough. I did a great job of reducing this tooth, but uh, you've again got the opportunity now to transform, to add and remove. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to click next and merge this crown. And then once again, I will cut away the in intersections with the opposing and with the adjacent. And there we have the final crown on this, okay? Now, uh, now would be probably a good time to go ahead and answer some other questions because that I'm gonna do the exact same process here as I talk on these two teeth. I'm just drawing a margin, I'm making the crown bottom, I'm going to finalize the crown and cut away intersections. So probably got a good 10 minutes here of that that I could answer questions, Michael, if there's more. How long would it take to prepare a full arch provisional with Blue Sky Bio software? Boy, it's, I mean, it's tough to say because um, that's so dependent on how, uh, how beat up the current dentition is, uh, how good of a, you know, idea you have of where the teeth need to be because there's an awful lot that goes into that, you know, from a smile design perspective. But with that said, if it's just a matter of, pulling teeth in and orienting them. I mean, 
not long at all, you can actually use the denture module to pull in an entire dentition and the teeth be on a chain where you can conform them exactly to the arch that you're working on. So it's very dependent on the individual case, but I would say I could do a full arch provisional wax up in, I don't know, 20 minutes. Uh, that's a guesstimation, but uh, I'd say that's probably pretty close. Okay. What is the longest dentulous space in a full arch provisional that you have successfully designed? Longest edentulous space, uh, all the teeth because again, I've used these on, on full arch hybrids. So there are no teeth in those, but um, I'm sure that it says on the indications, like that's usually something that has to be included on the FDA form uh, when they're getting approval. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. So you might have to just pull up the insert for that. Again, the, the resin that I'm speaking of, the only one that's approved in the US right now that I'm aware of is uh, made by Bego, B-E-G-O, and it's called Varseo Crown. So you can then very easily go online and look at any kind of packets that they have for that. Okay. What is the Envision Tech printer you were recommending? Any idea of that cost? And what about the shades of the resin and Vita based? Uh, I'm not sure about the Vita base aspect. Um, the shades, they've usually got all of the A's uh, shades and then like a bleach and a B1 and then usually like a isolated C color. Uh, I don't know what they are specifically off the top of my head. Since most of what I deal with is full arch type stuff, pretty much everybody's getting A1. I mean, that's just for simplicity what I've done. Um, but again, I know you could get online and look at that and see exactly what shades are offered. Um, and maybe, you know, at the end, if we have time, we could pull up their website and look at that. Uh, the Envision Tech printer, again, Envision Tech E100 or something like that. I, I don't remember. It's, it's some name with, you know, some letters and numbers. So I don't remember it off the top of my head, but uh, it's an excellent printer as well. I'm not sure on the cost, but I think it's sub $10,000. So again, uh, in terms of dental toys, you're talking about a very minimal investment. And again, where they really shine is, is uh, I mean, it's a great printer overall and, and they've got plenty of good stuff, but I, I love a lot of their materials. They've got super strong stuff. They've got in-house chemists and develop all their own materials. So it, it's an impressive printer. Okay. Can you design veneers in Blue Sky Bio? See... That's a hesitant yes, because it's not optimized right now. Like right now, if you just do the same workflow that I'm doing, um, what's gonna happen is that the software is optimized for crowns right now. And so things like an inlay or a veneer, they don't follow a routine uh, margin with 360 degree coverage. And so it's gonna just throw it haywire and you'll not get a good margin, the proposal will be all off. Now, with that said, we are creating that in upcoming builds. Again, it's just a matter of, of time and we'll have that available. Um, but in the meantime, there's some hacks that you can do that allow you to pull that off. For example, uh, the crown and bridge module, if you look here under teeth edit panel, you'll see that we've now got a Boolean operations menu. You gotta actually expand it or you won't see that. But hypothetically, let's say that we designed um, all these teeth and we pretty much positioned the margin of this tooth to match up exactly with the margin of that uh, model, you know, where your veneer margin was, you could simply do a Boolean subtraction of that underlying model plus an offset of 0.2, which it allows right here. And there you have your veneer. So it's not a dedicated workflow right now, but it's coming and there are hacks to do it right now. Okay, so the one if you discussed this already, the one million dollar question: If you were to buy a printer right now, what would you get and why? So I think you've already dedicated time to that. Yeah, it's, um, it's impossible for me to say because you're talking to a guy that now has fifteen printers, and I've got a few more on the way, and so I I wouldn't buy one. I would have a bunch of them because they've all got their their independent strengths and weaknesses. Um, 
you know, I guess part of the question is what do you, what are you most focused on printing with it? So I know that's a, a shady way out on that answer, but that's still my answer nonetheless. Okay. When fabricating full arch temps, does the software design the abutments with the right thickness? Full arch temps. Well, I, I mean, so the software doesn't distinguish between temps versus finals. It's all the same from the software's perspective. So yeah, if you were doing uh, temps, you know, in that example, then yeah, it's just looking at it as if it's a final crown and kind of like I just showed, it does show a, uh, a minimal thickness and you can set that to be whatever you want it to be. And so I guess in that regard, yeah, it would. To answer a question that just came in, the recording is going to be available um, after the webinar is over. So anybody that came in late or has to leave early, don't worry about that. Can you make a custom abutment? So that also is on the list, on the development list. We actually have development build for that. You could contact us and we could send that to you to hear your feedback. But that's not publicly released yet. That's still being uh, worked on. All right, that all of them? Right, no, there's more. Oh, okay. <laughs> How do you fabricate clear aligners? We're just a little bit off the topic. <laughs> but maybe in a few minutes, you could just summarize it, Corey. Just yeah. give a toss on one foot. You know, you, you push a few buttons, you move some models, and poof, there it is. Now, the easy answer to that is you upload it to uh, Lab Pronto and let someone else do it. I personally hate ortho. I took this big, long ortho continuum and swore I would never do an ortho case after taking it. Because from my perspective, it's like, you know, I can charge 5,000 bucks and do an implant abutment and crown in a single day, or I can charge 5,000 bucks and see this little heathen 40 times over the next six months and guess which one of those I'd rather do. So uh, I'm not a big ortho guy. Baron uh, Grutter is the man to talk to on ortho, but long story short, the software is gonna allow you to pull in their models rotate the teeth to ideal, and then it runs it through an algorithm of, you know, you tell it how many steps you want to do it, how many trays, or weekly, bi-weekly, and it just runs it through those parameters, and then will generate those models with the teeth being, you know, successively moved, and you just print those, suck them down. Um, a good thing to realize is that there's several materials on the horizon for directly printing the aligner, and Blue Sky Plan already spits out aligners too if you wanted to do that so everybody's waiting with bated breath for that to be live but that's going to be huge when that comes about and we have several webinars scheduled on the topics of aligners and orthodontics so check the schedule and uh, join those webinars we also have extensive recordings made by baron and others uh video sessions that you could go through the step-by-step -step process flow so there's a lot of available free educational material on that topic and all of our topics as well blueskyplan.com check it out there's a lot of great free educational material there um can we fabricate a full arch temp based on a digital wax up before prepping um well, at some point, you've still got to have, uh, so you, you've got to do one of two things. Yeah, you could do a wax up with Blue Sky Plan over their current dentition. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, again, ways that you could do a Boolean difference to uh, generate that. You could also kind of hack the software and, and you know, do, a, let's say, a uniform uh, half millimeter of reduction on every tooth and then, you know, subtract that from the model in blue sky or mesh mixer that would generate them. Um, or you could just kind of do it the old school and you could just prep on your, uh, your model and then design them as if they were crowns in blue sky. And, and then they'll have true marginal fit and everything like that. But um, you know, ultimately any of those options are going to work for that. Temps are kind of a little different animal because the prep doesn't exist yet, you know? So Okay, are we good to go on? I believe so. Okay. All right, so I've got all three of these crowns here ready to go now. And, um, 
you know, basically I've just got to, at this point, how do I do that? I've just got to create the bridge between them. Okay. And so what we're going to do here is go into, where is this, Michael? Should have, <laughs> should have prepared myself more. Where's the bridge function but here? You should have the button to create, to create a bridge. It should be there, shouldn't it? What happened here? I'm hoping I didn't have a, uh, like a development build or something. Well, it's not that exciting to see. There's a button here that says bridge. And if I had the right software version, you would see it. And I would push bridge and it would just turn these three individual crowns. It'll throw a connector in there. And now you've got one unit and that's your bridge. So I'm not sure exactly why that is not showing up, but such is life when you're doing something live. Um, again, it's really just the same workflow for, for a routine crown. All that you do at the end that's different is push the bridge button. So uh, we'll kind of stop on that and I'll do the last one for the live demo, which is the tie base crown. So I'm gonna hide all these teeth and let's get the mandibular scan body. Now, what you'll notice here is this is, uh, again, if you looked at the pre-op mandible, this was just in the edentulous site. And what I've done now is placed an implant into that type of knot and then just stuck a scan body on it. And if that scan body looks familiar, that is the same uh, shape. It's the same object actually as the uh, open or tro closed tray impression transfer. Excuse me, we've, we've now made those where they, they all control the timing. So they're consistent one to the other and uh, they're blasted. So they're still color coded, but they're blasted where they'll pick up easily in an intraoral scanner. So that single part can be used as a conventional impression transfer or as a scan body. And so that's all I did here is I placed this on and uh, you know now I need to align a scan body and an implant to it. So this is the one workflow that's a little bit different. To, to align a scan body, we can't do that in Crown and Bridge. We've actually got to go back to the implant module. And once you're in implant module, you're going to see up here, you've got add implant, add tooth, and then this one is add a scan body. So I can click on that. Well, Huh. I don't know what's going on here, Michael. It's like my software ate the, the buttons all at once. You're also trying to go through different process flows in the same process flow when I, on the start uh, screen. You're, you're right. Let, let's do that. Let's go ahead and close this. Because on the start screen, there's different options for, for right. the different types of crowns and for a bridge. See here, right here. Yep. Let's, and this is this I think is actually why you didn't see the bridge. I was trying to be cute and not do multiple imports. I, I tried to do it all in the same model. Uh, Michael, that's that's actually something we should address because I think we ought to be able to do that in, uh, you know, you could start one project and accomplish all those. But that is why I wasn't able to create the bridge because I didn't designate it up front. I just assumed that worked actually. So it's going to apply for the tie base crown as well. So here I'm just going to start out indicating that I'm doing a tie base crown and I need to go find my models. All right, once again, import them all simultaneously. All right, we'll do the same method of alignment that we did a little earlier. So I'm gonna place a three dots. And then next, finish. So now we're in model editing and now we can just proceed forward to scan body alignment.
I'm going to go ahead and hide these models. Help me, Michael. <laughs> What's going on here? It's a good question. This is literally the first time that's ever happened to me. What what should happen right here is that you just uh, you click add scan body and you've got all the different scan bodies here. I'm going to try to just do a shutdown and restart because this is definitely acting squirrely on me. Edit this out of the uh, the one that goes on YouTube. So we can act like there's never problems that ever arise in digital dentistry. All right, y'all are getting a lot of practice at this one. Just gonna line this real quick. If it's aligned, you could just skip the alignment. Yeah. Yeah, there. I don't know why I did that, but it, it just needed a restart. Okay, so we're gonna do the Blue Sky Bio MIJH, that's the part number for the, uh, again, the little thing that can be used as your conventional impression transfer or as a scan body. So I'm gonna click on that. And then I'm gonna go over here and hide some of these models so that I can see the one I wanna see. Let's go back and grab that again. All right, MIJH. And then I need to click on that ball and the software will automatically try to align it. Any questions right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, if, for your bridge design, can you assign or check a path or draw for both preps? Yes, and that's actually something that we're we're modifying because right now it's a bit redundant to do that in, you know, a single tooth design and then also in a bridge design. So, but yeah, you have the opportunity at both, but we're going to modify that to where it's just one dedicated workflow. You can jump around between teeth, design them with margins all at once and crown bottoms all at once and just try to eliminate some of the redundant steps on that. Okay. All right. I, uh, this time I'm just placing a tooth. So let's use the Bastion Deloge library. This is tooth number 30. As you see there, the software went ahead and aligned the scan body. And so now I'm gonna just position a tooth approximately. I don't have to have it perfect at this point. All right, that's good enough for right now. And you can see that it's aligned the implant underneath it. And you can swap that out to whatever, you know, this is gonna be a Biomax um, five by 10, let's say. We can also indicate what abutment we're gonna use. Okay, so right now, just the standard tie base is on there. But, you know, if I wanted to use, for example, that 1.8 millimeter emergence tie base that we have, I could swap out for that. 
the cool thing is I can also swap out for any of the stock abutments that are in blue sky. So I could position any of those and take a look at them as well. Uh, you know, a kiss abutment, something like that. But since we're going to do the, uh, the tie base here, I'm going to just go back to the tie base. There's the angled tie bases. Come on, where did that go? There it is. All right, this is just the standard tie base. Those of you who are Serac users, this is uh, compatible to Serona's tie bases. And with that done now, I can just go into the crown design. And we're ready to pretty much go ahead and design the crown. So I wanna do this on the mandibular pre-op, let's say. The crown that we're using is the first molar, and then it's going to ask you what tie base you're using because it needs to know that. So we're using this particular tie base. Our antagonist is the maxillary pre-op, and now we can start the process. So the first thing it's going to do is indicate a path of draw. Well, the tie base more or less defines your path of draw on this. So that's the direction it's going to be coming in from. Um, you can allow undercuts or not. We're just going to jump through this step. So now it's asking us to define the proximal area. You see that it's got a block out model. And now you're defining uh, a margin. Now it's not a margin necessarily, it's your emergence profile. Okay, so if I project that, I can modify it. Okay, so that's the emergence profile. If you'll remember, the abutment margin is gonna be out here, but we have to tell it what area of the gingiva do you wanna to conform to. So we're gonna do it to this area. Click next. All right, here is our crown. We can design the, the crown margin, again, similar to the previous step. We can adjust the tie base margin. You can see here that these little nodes can be moved and positioned as necessary. You can create more or less uh, tissue impingement, depending on what you're wanting there. Um, you can optionally create or not create a screw channel. So if you were doing like a screw mintable technique, you could toggle that on or off. We'll go ahead and jump through to the next. And there's our screw retained crown. And you see that I didn't really take the time here to adjust this occlusion and pull it up to how it should be just because I was just trying to fly through it. Uh, but you do see that the software forced a minimal distance around that tie base so that we can maintain that thickness that's required. So last step would be to cut the intersections. We'll finalize that and that would be your tie base crown. So again, the only difference I would do from what I just showed is just take more time in positioning the tooth. Uh, obviously I didn't make a contact or anything just for the sake of time. So uh, that's all the live demo I was going to do. I've got some cases I was going to show, but as I'm getting that back up, it'd be a good time for any questions, Michael. Okay. Let's see what do we have here. Um, is digital art articulation possible with the crown and bridge module using your software to design a full arch case for a patient as a D4 at UNC. Just want to say thank you for offering a free solution, especially for students trying to learn digital workflows. I appreciate everything you do. Okay, the bottom line is he's asking about digital articulations. Okay, so 
I'm not sure if what's meant by that is, uh, you know, the ability to pull in and stitch models to a different byte. So for example, if you, let's say you wanted to, you know, do a wax up at an increased vertical, I'd actually do that in the intraoral scanner. I'd prop them open to the right VDO, capture a buckle byte. And then, yeah, absolutely. You can stitch the models to that new opened vertical within Blue Sky. Michael, is our articulator functions live yet in the software? Because I know we've got versions of that I've played with, but I, I lose track of what's live and what's public. Yeah, you could import the different bytes. You could have the lower jaw open and close, move to different byte positions, view the contacts as it's moving from byte to byte. Yeah, that's uh, live okay. in the software. And that's in model editing, right? It's in different. It's also in, exists in ortho. It exists in. Uh, there's a, there's actually a panel for buckle bytes that focuses okay. on the functionality. Okay. So yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> Any others? Uh, no, we're good to right, continue. Great. Uh, so this was the type of dot that I designed that off of. Um, you know, again, I do sell this design, or I'll I'll actually print them for people too if you prefer that. Um, you just contact me about it, but you can see that was the, the bridge prep on this. You can see the number three prep and of course the implant. And what I did is I just designed these ahead of time and I went ahead and created the restorations. And so this is them directly out of the printer, uh, still on their supports. Excuse me. Um, one of the things to point out on this is this, especially you look at that tie base crown on the occlusal surface, it's got that really chalky look. Uh, part of the instructions of this material is that after you print it, you're going to alcohol wash it, and then it actually has to be sandblasted because this is such a highly filled resin that when it washes away that little bit of oxygen inhibited layer of resin, it leaves exposed portions of the filler particle. And so you do have to sandblast that to get rid of it. Uh, of course, that's going to only help your bond strength as well. And then you would just cure this, and then it's ready to go in the mouth. And I found these to fit incredibly well. This is the one I designed for the molar. Uh, if you look at the marginal integrity there, it is excellent on this. Uh, there's no perceivable marginal gaps or anything. Again, provided you did your design and matched it up at the margin. And then this was the tie base crown that I designed in Blue Sky where I actually took the time to shape it correctly. And uh, once again, you see it's just a simple crown that you can bond onto the tie base. Um, you know, this is a feature for those of you who are doing implants, this is a feature you might want to use, not necessarily for restorations, but think immediate load temporaries, or I'm sorry, not immediate load temporaries, uh, custom healing abutments. So you could simply do that design. And if you want to create a molar emergence on an implant that you've placed, well, you could just design the crown to full contour and then simply grind the occlusion down. And now you have a custom temporary and if the tissue heals to that exact shape, well, then you can just go and print or mill again the same shape. This time, just don't grind the occlusion off. And now you have your final restoration. So it can really streamline your workflow on that. And just a quick aside on that, the, the thing I would recommend doing if you're placing implants and if you have an intraoral scanner is, you know, how you can do a pre-op scan. Go ahead and do a pre-operative scan of both arches and your buckle bites so that that's all done. And then come back um, before uh, finishing up, once you've placed the implant, just cut out the little area where that scan body would be protruding and then fill that area back in with a scan body on the implant. You still flap open all of that, but it'll only pick up the scan body if that's the only area you cut out. Because what you've created with that one little step that just takes a minute or two is you've created the working model now that you could design their final restoration before they even have their second stage on recovery. So, you know, typically what we do is we bury it and then we do a second stage surgery and we put on a healing abutment and no one's stock healing abutment is shaped anything like a natural tooth. So it ends up healing to this perfect cylinder and then your crown ends up having that cylindrical shape too because it's just a backward workflow. Far better way to do this is Go ahead and design the final restoration while they're healing with the gingiva covering it, uh, they're protected, and then the final restoration's ready. At second stage uncovery, you just deliver the final or at least a really good temp and then form the tissue to that. 
but don't form it to a cylindrical healing abutment, which is an anatomic. Go ahead and design a restoration and let it be your, your healing abutment. And you'll find you'll get a lot better soft tissue around your implants. Uh, so that's a really useful workflow. I uh, went ahead and printed the bridge and the single crown, and you can see the fit of those. I wasn't holding it down with my finger here, so it's unseating on the margins uh, just a little bit right there. But the fit on these is excellent. It, it really is comparable with most of your ceramic crowns. So just a couple clinical cases. Um, uh, a buddy of mine, Dr. Aaron Carmine, is here in my same town, and both of us had a mutual friend that uh, was missing uh, tooth number 12, I think it was, just drove us both nuts because he could have replaced it. He just wasn't. And so Aaron was starting to learn implants and, uh, you know, was having me teach him some things. So I said, well, let's do it, an implant on, on our buddy. So we just decided to do this. Now, the only kicker is that he was moving to Hawaii uh, just a couple of weeks after we placed this implant. So there's not going to be any recall on this. And since he was getting it for free, we thought, you know what the heck, let's go ahead and just place the implant, restore it with the final restoration all at once. And so that's kind of where this case is going. So we did the normal implant planning and blue sky plan. And then we went ahead and designed a crown uh, to final contours. Oops. Uh, so that's an important aspect because we want to create the ideal uh, gingival contour and everything on this right from the start. Okay, we don't want to go through healing abutments and all that. So we designed the final crown. We got the, the occlusion and everything perfectly dialed in. And then we planned the implant backwards from that ideal prosthesis. And so this, if I remember correctly, is a 4.3 by 10. And going with that implant size, it's going to put it a couple millimeters into the sinus. So uh, this was Aaron's first implant he ever placed, and he did immediate load, immediate restoration, and a crestal sinus lift. So he really got to go all in on his first one. But you see here the implant positioning, again, a little into the sinus, but we're following the, uh, you know, the zero bone loss concepts. We've got a good couple of millimeters on each side of the implant of native bone, because we want to, that's a really important aspect for the long-term stability here. And now, even though we haven't even done this surgery. We've positioned the virtual implant and we're going to do guided surgery. So we know it's going to end up there. So we could go ahead and make the final restoration and have it ready to deliver at the time of surgery. So it's exact same workflow that I was just showing you for the tie base crown. If you've got an implant, you can now add an abutment. We chose the uh, 1.8 millimeter emergence tie base. And now we go into the crown and bridge module and we use this crown and this tie base to create a screw retained restoration. And now we went back and exported that and now we're creating the surgical guide. <clears throat> now the one tricky part to this is that I've got to ensure that the implant is in the exact same degree of rotation in the mouth that it was in the software. Okay, because if you think about it, all your abutments, at least in Biomax, they've got a hex. So there's one of six ways that it can seat in there. So if I'm 20 degrees of rotation off from one of those, well, everything's going to go on crooked. And so that's an important thing to translate here. During our guided surgery, we've got to get that timing of that implant exactly right. So what I did to do that is I can just turn off the model and I'm looking from the coronal straight through the guide and I'm just noting exactly where the flat is oriented on this implant, okay? You can see it here at the top and the bottom. And as long as I create some kind of a timing mark on this guide and know to rotate the driver to that exact same position, then the flat of my real implant will end up exactly like the flat of this implant, okay? And you can do that with the text emboss tool. Um, I'll just turn the text emboss on and create a little I right on the guide, like the letter I, and that will create you a timing mark. So again, when we go into surgery, we just need to, the driver has six lines for each of your flats. Make sure you put a flat right to that line and then everything should line up. Now, this is the first time we'd ever tried something like this. So I thought it'd be wise to go ahead and try it on models first in theory and make sure it all works. So this is just a model filled with foam that I could drill on 
I did the guided surgery on it. I placed the implant. Now I'm putting on that tie base. And in theory, if all of this worked right, then this printed crown, which I've not even tried on yet, should drop right onto that with ideal contacts, ideal occlusion, all of that. And sure enough, it did. Straight out of the printer, this was no adjustments or anything. So I'm just gonna remove the supports and go ahead and bond that in place. And that's gonna be ready to deliver at the end of this procedure. So for your surgery, I always put the guide on and then take an indelible ink stick and you know poke through the tissue. And that just gives me a purple dot and says, here's where the implant's gonna go. And then my incision is just lingual to that. So that's what I had Aaron do here. And then just roll it to the buckle enough to expose the crest. The osteotomies are done. And again, we had to do a sinus bump here. So we didn't go all the way to depth. We just went to the sinus floor. And then we switched over to the safe ended sinus burrs. And these allowed us to breach the sinus membrane or breach the sinus floor and get access to the membrane without perforating it. It's a really dummy proof kit. We have a guided version too, although I was using the non-guided this day. And then once he placed a little bit of bone graft in there and lifted the sinus, now he places the implant. And you can see the picture on the left has that the mark on the driver. Um, there's six of these. They all correspond to the flats of the implants. So here's my timing mark. And I've got to make sure that that driver mark lines up exactly to the timing mark. So we did that. Our stopper is bottomed out. So we know it's at the right depth. And when we remove the guide, this is our implant. Now, again, in theory, if everything was accurate, we should be able to take the pre-made final restoration and it should just drop into place and torque all the way in. And sure enough, it did. And I, had, I didn't even take a shade on this guy. Again, everyone in my office or my lab, I guess you'd say, is an A2. And thankfully he was an A2, so it worked out great because otherwise he was gonna have a mismatched tooth, but uh, he wouldn't have cared, it was free. But anyways, this is the final crown and you can see the emergence was pre-developed to be ideal. And so we're gonna just suture the tissue loosely around this and it will form and take the shape of this crown as opposed to a cylindrical healing abutment, which is not really anatomically correct. And so this was how he walked out and didn't hardly have any pain or anything. Saw him the next day, he was doing great. And, uh, you know, I, I'll do Facebook video messenger with him periodically from Hawaii and he's just eaten everything in sight with it. it. It all went perfectly. He's had no issues whatsoever. It's all integrated. So I just thought that was an impressive workflow to be able to guide the implant, place it and deliver the final restoration on the same day and the accuracy, accuracy be so good that everything would fit. That, that really to me attested to the power of guided surgery and the Blue Sky kit, as well as the softwares, the guided software and the Crown and Bridge. Okay, that's how he was sutured up. Um, again, if, if you have any problem, it's gonna be that the tissue doesn't die back enough to match you know, these adjacent teeth. Um, you get a tremendous amount of tissue uh, attached gingiva when you do things this way, because everything in that gap, since we're not getting primary closure, that's going to fill in and create keratinized gingiva. And again, the only thing that could go south is that this won't recede enough. It will recede a little bit during healing, but I've actually had some cases where I actually had to go back and trim that tissue down a little bit. There's final x-ray. You can see the sinus was right here and it's uh, kind of radiolucent, but there's a bit of bone over the apex of the implant here. And that's what this material looks like on an x-ray. Uh, so a really neat workflow. And again, I, all credit for this one is to Dr. Aaron Carmine. Uh, and this was his first implant, which again, is pretty impressive. Um, all right, so I always in my webinars try to do some kind of out there stuff uh, so you don't get bored. So this was kind of a crazy idea I had of, you know, everyone, every dentist I know hates fillings. You know, you just want to jump off a bridge when you see a, an afternoon full of MOD, MOD, MOD on your schedule. So what if you could potentially create those ahead of time? And instead of having to do all these direct composites, you could just bond in your fillings. I thought that sounded interesting. So 
uh, that's what I did. And now this is a hack. This is not something you can do in Blue Sky just yet, although that's how this stuff happens as we think it up and work it out in other softwares and, and then we turn it into a workflow. So all I did on this is uh, I had a pre-op and I just went in and using a select tool, I just outlined the restoration, okay? And now I have to do a couple of things. I've got to make sure that my prep is big enough to accommodate that restoration. And I'm just kind of doing that based on, you know, looking at an x-ray and how big do I think this is going to be, how wide, how deep, all that. Um, but then I have to also create some way of indexing it into place. Because imagine you've got this tiny little inlay and you drop it in and you squish it down through a ton of composite and it's way too deep now, right? That wouldn't work. And so what I did is I created on the adjacent teeth, these little indexing feet. And this is again, the beauty of 3D printing. There's no way you can mill a shape like this, but I've gone ahead and pre-made an inlay filling so it's highly cured, it's extremely strong, it's stronger than your direct composite. And then I can print these ahead of time. And you can do a whole quadrant or a whole mouth of these. Um, again, you're talking a milliliter of resin, so it's a dollar, it's not a big deal. So I time-lapsed that obviously, because that's a little more involved, but I'm just trying to show you what's possible. Then I made a prep guide. You know, again, I've got to make sure that my fillings actually are big enough to accommodate that, uh, that pre-printed filling. And so this can go on and I can just outline this with a burr and then that gives me my convenience form and then I can remove carries. It might get bigger and getting bigger, that's not a problem, but it just needs to be at least that big or you'll have to trim on the restoration. Okay, so this is kind of what these things looked like after they were pre-printed. Uh, we did an 18 MO and a number 19 occlusal composite. And so here was the pre-op. We used the prep guide, um, just doing this on models, did the prep on these, um, you know, things like depth of the box, that doesn't necessarily matter because you're going to just place a band around this tooth and, you know, some uncured composite and squish it in. So the excess is going to flow out, you'll have a closed box and you can tease away the excess. Uh, but I did outline the prep. I removed all the extensive caries in this uh, plastic tooth. And now I'm just trying in the restorations. And sure enough, they fit perfectly in there. Now, again, you say, well, heck, there's a big marginal gap. Okay, that's that's true. But again, where, where do fillings usually go south? It's that we never make our central groove deep enough. You know, the anatomy, this marginal ridge is off and we grind it all away. And it looks like a thumbprint at the end of it. Well, with this, all of those key areas of anatomy are being located ahead of time. And these little feet index it into the tooth so that it's in the perfect position as their pre-op anatomy or their wax up if, you know, if their tooth was bombed out and you had done a wax up in Blue Sky Plan, same difference. And so at this point, you just place some composite into the prep and you squish this down, index it on those adjacent teeth until it's fully seated. And as you see, it squishes out some excess there on the far right. I just take an Indo Explorer or a brush and just tease away that excess and then light cure it all. And the result is that you've got less shrinkage contraction because it's mostly pre-cured. It's just a thin lining all around it that is being cured, um, you know, in the paste form. Okay, and that's the final restorations. Again, I don't have the side by side of their pre-op, but it's identical to this uh, because it was their pre-op anatomy. We just reprinted it. So I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, it saves some chair time. The, the cool thing is that it just perfectly recreates anatomy. And if you do this right at the end, there is no occlusal adjustment to do because it's their same tooth. And again, it minimizes some shrinkage. Uh, veneers, a few of you asked about that. This was the guy I showed early on in the case or in the presentation. I didn't do this clinically. This was a guy I did a full mouth rehab on years ago, but I still had his models and I thought they were a great example just to demonstrate this. So really worn dentition. You could simply scan this and go into Blue Sky Plan, design a wax up basically, and then Boolean subtraction this model out. And the result is that you would get a bunch of veneers. Okay, so I can pre-print those. Now I made these as like the taco shell design where they cover buckle and lingual. They're easier to index. 
you know, he's worn his linguals, so he needs lingual coverage as well. But I'm not touching the contact of the tooth, which is preserving a lot of tooth structure. So this guy, hypothetically, if I was doing this case, comes in, we don't even touch a burr to his tooth. Maybe we use a, a sandblaster and just clean his tooth real well with pumice. We etch them, bond them. The restorations are tried in, and then we just bond them into place with the veneer cement. And you could have a single appointment full mouth rehab. Okay, so you can see this is all additive. And we accomplish a full mouth rehab in a single appointment. And maybe this is not how you want to do a full mouth rehab. It'd be a great option for a budget case, a charity case, something like that. But one of the keys I found to doing full mouth rehab efficiently was to basically do the rehab in composite first, because then all the stress is off. Now, if everything's to full contour and you've solved the aesthetic problems, now you can just do single tooth dentistry, you know, do a couple of crowns this week get them back to deliver those and prep another couple. You, you're just doing single tooth dentistry because the bite's stable and all that. Well, same thing here. If you could just do the full rehab in one appointment with this composite, you still might convert it to porcelain or zirconia, but now you've, you've established all of the aesthetic parameters you were trying to accomplish on the front end and everything is set up ideal. And then you can simply come back and uh, convert those to porcelain if you want to. So that's those on the model. Again, check out that marginal fit. These are exactly where I planned them to. And so it's hard to beat this. Um, Snap-on smile, you know, that's a product that you can get from a lab. You can make your own kind of redneck version of that. Again, just goes back to the idea of doing a Boolean subtraction of the model from the, let's say, wax up you've done in Blue Sky Plan. So I was just playing around with this idea and I did this on my own teeth. So these are gonna be way over contoured, but I just did a wax up. I made the wax up teeth be bigger in contour than my existing teeth, added length and whatnot. And then 3D printed that after I did the Boolean subtraction. And this is straight out of the printer, slides right on over my teeth. And so, you know, I wouldn't tell someone to function on this, but you know, if they got a wedding coming up or I call these church teeth, you know, you can wear them to church and no one will know you're toothless, but you don't function on these things. So that's a cool idea that you can do with this. Uh, full arches, again, I started out saying with this new resin, I've done this um, on probably 15 to 20 full arches at this point. So the workflow we usually do is a bone reduction guide, a drill guide, and then we have the prosthesis where it indexes off the bone and it puts it at the right vertical and occlusal position. And we just pre-make the holes so that our cylinders are emerging through that because we're guiding it, we know where they're gonna end up. And so this is right after placing the implants and putting temp cylinders on. And again, everything lined up perfectly. The cylinders were right in the middle of the hole. And all you've gotta do is just rinse and dry this and then squirt some acrylic or dual cure composite to join the cylinders to the temporary. And that gives you an immediate load prosthesis, way, way stronger than like converting a denture because you haven't ground out tons of material that you have to patch back together. Um, so I, I think that's a big part of why these are holding up so well. But again, knock on wood, it's not FDA approved for this. So don't tell them I said that it's, uh, supposed to be used for this. It's not technically, but as a doctor, you can go off label, which is what I did. So um, this is working great in my experience so far. And that was actually this guy's restoration, bone reduction, drill guide, and then the bone index prosthesis. And he walked out that day with some teeth and that was his bite when he first bit down. That tells you how accurate all of this was. There was virtually no adjustment to do on his bite. Um, you know, this was designed in Blue Sky Plan as well. This is a superstructure for a, uh, a hybrid denture. Okay, so what we did, if you've seen the videos I've done on the Cal technique, the California adhesive looting, it's, uh, to summarize, it's a really cheap and easy way to make a full arch bar, and it's dirt cheap, because basically you can cast it, and then, uh, I'm sorry, printed and castable. Your local lab casts it for a hundred bucks. And it's designed such that it passively fits over the implants with a 0.3 cement spacer. 
The idea being that casting all the stuff, verified cast, we still ultimately can't get perfect passivity. There's error in every step. So the Cal technique says, yeah, there's gonna be error. So let's just build this to account for it. So you've got this little gap between the cylinder and the, the wall of the tube in your bar, which you pick up in resin cement. So now you've got a absolutely dead passive verified bar, and then you can make whatever superstructure you want over the top of that. So in my case, I used the denture module to bring in a full dentition of teeth, upper and lower. And I designed a gingiva on it. And I used the crown and bridge to dial in occlusion and everything. And then I just did a Boolean subtraction of the intraoral scan of that bar and came up with this. Okay, so this is how it's going out to the doctor. I uh, made him a couple versions. That's the only reason I haven't fully wrapped the bar because he's going to get to screw the bar in and then try this version on, try the other version on. And whichever one they like better, they will pick up the bar inside of this restoration with the resin cement. And the only thing they'll need to do is salt and pepper over the top of it uh, to create an ovate contour. So, you know, it's essentially a hundred dollar hybrid restoration. It's hard to beat that. And it's more passive than you're going to get with the best digital workflow and sure analog workflow because of using that Cal technique. And then the whole restoration, all that is is printed Bego resin and triad and then a sealer over the top of it. Man, I mean, talk about cheap. That's an excellent option. All right. So last, I got one more thing to cover, Michael, but this is a good time to do tooth related questions. I think uh, people are more in shock than anything else. Um, <laughs> in terms of questions, we have couple come in with your form 3b have you had any problems with, with adherence to the build plate if trying to print a single crown or a similar small object I, I have not run into it i've done a lot of single crowns on there um and thus far it's not been an issue they they tend to pop off um a thing to be aware of with the form 3b is that there's a different build plate that you're supposed to use for these resins so if you're using the permanent crown and bridge resin, there's a stainless steel build plate. <clears throat> and I don't, I'm not 100% sure on this, but as I understand it, apparently these resins, because they have so much filler in them, they can actually abrade away a, an aluminum build plate, which is what most of them are. And so you need the stainless steel one for it to hold up in the long term of using this. Um, but yeah, I've not really had any issues with that. Okay, how do you... Preview, uh, preview the index position of the implant when planning a tie-based crown before surgery. Well, because remember, you've got your virtual implant. And so when you position a tie base on it, that shows you exactly where the tie base margin is. So that might tell you that you're placing it way too deep or way too shallow. But it's purely a, a matter of just right-clicking the implant. And I should say this only works with Blue Sky implants because... Obviously, we have the shapes and the files for all of our abutments, but, you know, for example, if you're using Strauman, we're not going to have their prosthetics in there. They, they have to provide those to us, and no company has done that. So uh, this would only be for Blue Sky implants or lines that we're compatible to, but you just swap in the tie base, and now you see where its margin is or whatever abutment, and you can plan your crown and everything accordingly. We're actually in the process. I think there are some prosthetic libraries in the software recently oh, released, okay. and we're definitely in the process of adding a whole bunch more. Um, so that exists partially, and it's going to continue to grow. All right, that's good news. Um, okay, that's all for the questions right now. Okay, well, I am. Uh, I'm done talking teeth. I was just going to kind of talk about a new project I'm undertaking. You know, I've been pulled in a million different directions with all the different junk I've been doing and trying to figure out a way to centralize those efforts. And the stars have finally aligned to do that. And so uh, myself and Dr. Ben Kellum, if any of you know him, uh, he's in Birmingham. We are, we are starting a clinic in Huntsville, Alabama, that is going to be like a low cost um, ministry community-based type clinic, you know, but unlike most of those type clinics, all ours is going to do is implants, full arch implants, and uh, full arch restorations. So we're kind of doing, 
these really high end, super complex, expensive treatments at dirt low cost. So, you know, if any of y'all are in driving vicinity of Huntsville, uh, it's probably going to be roughly $5,000 for a full arch of implants and any type of full arch restorations or conia, whatever. Um, because we're really doing that part as kind of a ministry. Uh, we'd, we'd rather not make money off of these poorer patients. We'd rather make it off you rich dentists. So uh, your turn's coming here. Uh, but, you know, we're pretty proud of what we've done so far. It, I believe, is going to be the most high-tech dental clinic in the United States. Um, you know, we have found a lot of manufacturing partners that are super excited about working with us on this. They love the vision of it. And so we've got as much technology as any clinic I'm aware of. Um, and just to rattle a few off, off the top of my head, you know, we've got the Axis Mills, we've got the, the 4X400, which will do discs, uh, it's five axis, it'll do light titanium duty. We've got their big boy mill, the 200, which can uh, mill titanium discs. So we can do all our own bars in house. We've got a meta intraoral scanner. We've got a shining 3D intraoral scanner. We've got the CareStream 3700 intraoral scanner. Printers, we've got Form 3. We've got uh, all the Sprint Ray printers. We've got Envision Tech. Um, we've got a ton of desktop scanners. Uh, we're trying to be very efficient with this since we're not charging much. And so we have a Medit scanner for full arch, purely digital workflow. Um, really the only good way to do true full arch hybrids on implants and stuff and actually have it passive right now is using this Medit scanner because it can correct your implant uh, positions of an intraoral scan down to like two microns of error across arch. It's crazy. Um, we've got CareStream 9600 cone beam that does the whole head. We've got um, a facial scanner built into that. We've got a Shining 3D facial scanner. We've got the Instaresa, fa Instaresa facial scanner. And we're doing a lot of work with combining facial scans and really doing facially driven treatment planning and, and delivering services. So super excited about all that that's coming. Uh, we've purchased a building in Huntsville. It's about 6,200 square feet. Um, and the clinic will occupy most of that. But the other cool thing that brings me to the next topic is that there's a very large warehouse attached that is climate controlled. And so as part of this, you know, we're going to go broke if that's our only thing, because we're not really doing that to take uh, to make money. So the actual business that we're running is a, uh, a teaching institute and a fully digital dental lab. Um, so our clinic is named Redemption Dental Clinic. Uh, the lab is Redemption Dental Lab. You know, for the lab, again, we're 100% digital. We don't ever want to see an impression or a piece of stone. You know, everything's going to be done off scans. Um, it's run and owned by dentists. You know, myself and Ben, we're both dentists that have done a lot of this complex work. And so we're last eyes on everything that we do. Uh, we'll be able to fill a niche that many labs cannot do because of just not having that treatment planning uh, background of knowledge, uh, a lot of full arch surgical guides, um, a lot of things like that. And we sell a bunch of job, different stuff, practice models, demo models. You know, if, you, uh, if you've if you priced um, the demo models for like consults, say you wanted to show a patient, what does an all on four look like? Well, there's plenty of places that will sell you the models that have the implants in them and a zirconia hybrid. It's darn near as much as paying the, the typical lab bill because basically they are, they're doing a typical lab bill. Um, for us, we're gonna make all of those same type of demo models for anything you can think of, um, but primarily printed and customized. Um, we can put your logo on them and whatnot, but we do that as well. And then for our dental institute, you know, we're, we're really hoping to educate doctors and all of this knowledge in um, digital dentistry that we've accumulated between us. Uh, a little background on Ben, he, he has been the leader of a, an implant residency for the last four years, took it from 100% analog to 100% digital, had 11 residents under him. Basically all he got to do was fix uh, screw ups from other people, you know, so all he got was hard cases. But, you know, they were doing three or 400 hybrids a year with Ben designing, milling, centering, all of that for all of them. And so we've got a lot of knowledge to offer, uh, we feel like. So we're going to do um, comprehensive dental uh, implant education and not just guided. We're talking about 
surgery. Um, that's one of the reasons we chose Huntsville is because Alabama is one of only three states that will allow out-of-state doctors to come in and give license reciprocity so you can do surgery there. So you won't necessarily have to go to the Caribbean or Mexico or wherever to, to get implant training. We're going to be able to do that in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, we're going to do all aspects of dental technology. Um, we'll do courses in dentures, but digital dentures. It, we're doing all forms of dentistry except pedo and endo, maybe endo, but never pedo. Um, but we're doing it all with a digital bent because that's our area of expertise. And so we're going to train in all those areas. Um, our hands-on exercises are going to be, I don't think, able to be replicated by anyone else because we are literally going to have all the technology sitting right there. So if we're teaching a milling course, you're going to scan on typodonts that you prepped and then you're going to design it and then you're going to mill it. You know, it's a, a really big focus of ours that we really teach you the actual workflows on the real equipment. And then again, live patient courses, uh, you know, we'll have, um, you know, simple implant placement all the way up to complex full arch. Um, all of that stuff is things that we'll be offering. Um, I'm going to hope this doesn't run sound here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is the building that we've purchased. It's currently a movie production place, but the big parking lot outside. Uh, this was just a walkthrough I did when we were looking at purchasing it. But we've got to uh, knock out a bunch of walls and uh, retrofit things for uh, operatories and everything, but it's a, a very nice large building. And so we're very excited about that. I won't bore you with sitting here watching every last bit of this video, but uh, yeah, we'll just skip on to the next one. Uh, it's got a second story, which will have lots of offices and stuff in. Come on, let me out of this. All right, this is being difficult. Let me move all my icons here and just skip to the end. There's our realtor. Okay. Hang on, I'm gonna have to just get out of this presentation to get past that. There we go. And so this is our, uh, our floor plan. You can see all of this is uh, currently offices and things. Basically this whole area back here uh, up to this area labeled break room is gonna become operatories. We'll probably have eight to 10 operatories outfitted with the, the best of the best stuff. And then our lecture uh, content and our digital lab will all be out here. So again, you're gonna be hearing lecturing about let's say milling or printing and that mill or that printer is right there next to you and can see it in action, use it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so just kind of some of the proposals we've played around on. This is the exterior of the building, which is nothing to write home about, but again, it's what's gonna happen on the inside that uh, we're excited about. And, um, you know, we're, again, that's the warehouse. So it, that's going to get retrofitted. Again, right now it's set up for movie production. But we're super excited about that. You know, we'll have more information about those courses uh, coming up very soon. We've got to get some of the renovating done before that's live. But by summer, for sure, everything should be up and running. The courses will probably be up and going by May. Um, I do have one course on the books with Ben, which is kind of our guided surgery and implants level one, which is learning the biology and technique and everything of placing implants, but also how to do guided. So this kind of covers guided A to Z and we touch on full arch, but we don't spend a ton of time on it because that's really my uh, level two course, which I'm also teaching here next weekend, if I'm not mistaken, in Lafayette, Louisiana with Danny Doming. Uh, Danny's an absolute surgical wizard on this stuff and uh you know the signups for those the, the one with me and danny is at digitaldentalmasters.com the guided surgery one is going to be at eventbrite uh, you can just search my name and you'll find that but this is my email and my website which again may be down but you could try it but uh that is all i have michael unless there is any questions we also have uh links to all of the live courses and remote courses. And of course the webinars organized on the website on blueskyplan.com. Yeah. So if you're looking for any of Corey's courses, they're all listed there. I think they're also 
showing up in the Facebook uh, calendar for the Blue Sky Bio Facebook group. And of course, if you're not part of that group, then it's a fantastic group of, of education, collaboration, uh, announcements, and new releases and everything else. So if you're not part of that Facebook group, it's the blueskybio.com user group. Just go ahead and uh, request to join that. Um, okay, if anybody has questions, we'll be here for a few more minutes. Corey, it sounds like you need a 24-7 live stream from your new facility that you're building. Well, that, so that's, that's the goal. Yeah, we're going to have uh, a lot of online teaching. Um, you know, we've developed a surgical camera that we'll be able to wear during surgery so that you can, you know, see surgeries live and all that. So, yeah, we'll be teaching the, the milling is a big component of what we'll be doing because right now, if you buy one of these uh, five axis mills, for example, there's just virtually nowhere to go to learn how to use it. So that's a, a big thing that we'll be doing. But uh, yeah, we hope to see all of you there soon. Uh, we think it's gonna be a pretty special place. Okay, so just to repeat some of the items I mentioned at the beginning, the CE credit should be sent within a week or two to your email. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers and topics in the webinar series. All the information is on blueskyplan.com. So just uh, go there, click on education. You'll see all the upcoming webinars. And there's fantastic resources to recorded webinars, to training videos, and a tremendous amount of educational material there as well. Uh, so, I, Corey, I think we're pretty much uh, wrapped. There's a lot of comments coming in thanking you for the great presentation, opportunity, uh, education. So uh, we all greatly appreciate that. And yeah, I appreciate y'all working or uh, tuning in to watch it. Yeah, and uh, we have a lot of great uh, updates coming out with the software and Blue Sky Bio in general. So uh, stay connected, stay involved, and, uh, and we'll keep them coming. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you.